Chicken Little was not the brightest chicken in the coop. He was very excitable and prone to foolishness. One day, he was doing nothing, his usual pastime, when an acorn fell from the sky and hit him on the head. It knocked him senseless. Oh my goodness, oh my gracious, he exclaimed. The sky is falling. I must run for my life. Do you remember this story, Chicken Little? You know, I did a lot more research than I would like to admit uh, in prep for the sermon about the origins of the story of Chicken Little. Most editions uh, talk about how Chicken Little, after he exclaims that the sky is falling, he goes off to share the news with a bunch of different creatures, creatures like Henny Penny, Lucky Ducky, Lucy Goosey, and Turkey Lurkey. I could come up with those names, I think. Uh, and what I found interesting is that there was, there's not really a canon when it comes to Chicken Little editions. Uh, many different modern editions end with uh, him saying, I must go tell the king. And he brings all these different animals. He uh, stirs up panic within them. They go and tell the king, and the king sets them straight. Oh, Chicken Little, it was but an acorn that fell uh, on your head and sends them on their way. Several other editions, and most of them, there's a creature called Foxy Loxy that they encounter who's trying to lure these creatures into their, into his, uh, into their den, to their cave. Uh, and most of those, some miracle happens and they're able to run out safely. But if you go back to the earliest editions, back in the 1800s, believe it or not, all of these end with all the animals' death, including Chicken Little. Now, you didn't want to know that, did you, in the sermon on a Sunday morning? But part of the origin of this story, and not, we really don't know all the roots uh, where the story of Chicken Little uh, originally came from, came from different European countries. Part of the point of this story is that the end result in panic and fear-mongering often leads to societal destruction. That's kind of the point of Chicken Little, and not really one that I will spend a lot of time reading uh, to, to my kids. Um, but it, I found it interesting, back in 1895, the term Chicken Little was included in Webster's Dictionary for the first time, and it was defined as one who warns of or predicts calamity, especially without justification. In the 1950s, the term began to be used by behavioral scientists who rec and recognize what uh, is called the Chicken Little Syndrome. This is defined as inferring catastrophic conclusions, possibly resulting in paralysis, or a sense of despair or passivity which blocks the audience from actions. The Chicken Little Syndrome. Now, why in the world am I talking about Chicken Little? Well, as we've seen the past few weeks, the past few months, the past past few years, in fact, uh, election seasons often have the uh, result of producing panic and producing fear and stirring up social anxiety. Most modern political discourse is built and fueled by angst and societal anxiety. And so you'll have politicians or political parties, they'll come out and say, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, but I know how to fix it right? The sky is falling, but our party has the answers. This policy is the most important policy you'll ever, you've heard it, right? That's what we've been hearing for weeks and weeks and weeks. The sky is falling, but we know how to fix it. And in the wake of the election, some people, like Chicken Little, might feel a sense of panic, fearing what this outcome might mean. Otherwise, others, meanwhile, feel relief and perhaps even excitement convinced that this change will solve all the world's problems and secure a better future. But what I want us to realize is that both reactions have the potential of sharing a common anxiety. Whether we're fearful or whether we're hopeful, we can be tempted to place our confidence in human leaders and human systems as though they ultimately control our future. And this is why we've been considering together the kingdom of God the past few weeks. As Robert showed us a few weeks ago, 
we have a different kind of king, and this king is named Jesus. As Mike showed us last week, we live in a different kind of kingdom, and our allegiance is not to a donkey nor an elephant, but to a slain lamb. So the question I'd like for us to consider this morning is how do we respond as citizens of this great kingdom? And in order to do that, I thought of no better place but the beginning of Jesus' great sermon on the mount, in the beginning of Matthew chapter 5. This could be considered his state of the union in many ways. He takes this posture of authority and he declares this is what kingdom living looks like. Before we get into our home text, I want to set the stage a little bit uh, in the previous verses at the end of Matthew chapter 4. The phrase, the kingdom of heaven, is another way of saying the kingdom of God, but in Matthew's gospel, the kingdom of heaven is referred to all over the place and eight times even in the Sermon on the Mount. In the beginning of chapter 3, John the Baptist comes on the scene preaching in the wilderness And he's preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In chapter 4, verse 17, from that time, right after his temptations, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what we see right before he delivers this great speech, this great sermon, this great um, uh, powerful charge of what it looks like to live in this kingdom we see that his fame is spreading around the land and crowds are coming to him for healing and crowds are coming for him, to him for direction. Verse 23 through 25 of chapter 4, it's on the screen here. He went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. The good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. And so his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Now, why is this significant? From the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, He is speaking about the kingdom of God, or as Matthew calls it, the kingdom of the heavens. As his fame spreads throughout and great crowds come to him, he delivers a sermon that is chiefly about what it looks like to live in this kingdom. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And here's how we live in it. Here's how we function in it. This is what it means to be a citizen of this great kingdom. And I want you to notice that as he speaks, he speaks with authority. These first two verses of chapter 5 are significant. And I think, uh, especially for a Jewish reader uh, at this time, would see something perhaps behind the words. That Jesus is beginning to fulfill someone they have been waiting for. Seeing the crowds, Jesus, he went up on the mountain And when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, but before we get to what he said, I want you to notice the important setting of this event, as he goes up on the mountain. Now, this could just be a mere geographical observation, but I'm convinced there's something more here, that any Jew who knows their Hebrew Bible would see this event and connect Jesus' teaching on this mountain with another teaching that came from another mountain, namely Moses from Mount Sinai. If you have been reading through Matthew from chapter 1 up until this point, you'll see a lot of fulfillment language. Matthew over and over and over, in order for the word of God to be fulfilled, this happened and this happened and this happened. Fulfillment, fulfillment, fulfillment. And then building up into this, we see now he goes up on the mountain and he speaks from the mountain. Mountains in the ancient time were the intersection of heaven and earth. That's why temples were often built on mountain peaks. And that's why the Old Testament prophesies about Mount Zion and this new temple to be built where God would be uh, judging the whole world from the highest mountain peak. Jesus ascends the mountain and he speaks. And when he speaks, he speaks with authority. Moses knew this was coming. 
Back in Deuteronomy chapter 18, 15 through 19, it says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb or Sinai on the day of the assembly when you said, quote, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name. I myself will require it of him. You see, God's people have not just been waiting for a Messiah. They've been waiting for a new Moses, a new prophet, a better prophet, a better Moses. And that's why it emphasizes in this great sermon that the crowds are amazed at his teaching because he taught with authority. At the very end of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7, verse 29, it says they were amazed because he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. You see, Jesus was not just any ordinary teacher. The Jewish people had plenty of those, plenty of rabbis who would tell you, this is what God desires. This is what is true. This is what is real. This is what is right. No, he, had, he was not just an ordinary teacher. He taught with authority because he is the new and better Moses. And just like Moses speaks on behalf of God to the people of God, what God requires of them as he delivers these Ten Commandments and everything that comes with them to the people of God upon the Exodus, Jesus now speaks from the mountain and what does he have to say? Now let's listen carefully to what he has to say. He could have started all sorts of different places, right? What might you expect as you are now following Jesus and you see all these miracles he's doing, all these healings he's doing? I want you to imagine you're following him in this crowd. And you're excited because you're going to hear this sermon. You're going to hear him teach. You're going to hear him proclaim. What might you expect him to say? Perhaps now we're going to get some more commandments. Another big ten that we can work with. Is that what you expect? Instead, he gives them what is called often in our Bibles the Beatitudes. Verse 3 through 12. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That's his first words. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. For they shall be comforted. Blessed are are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know, these verses are often called, like as I said, the Beatitudes. And the word Beatitude... Is, simply comes from the Latin word that means blessing. This is a list of blessings. A list, a list of uh, blessings. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment that you were to sit down and you were to write out a list. And this list would contain all the types of people that would be blessed by God. Who would make the cut? And if you were to make a list, one through ten, this is the type of person that God would bless. I came across a list in one commentary uh, a pretend list like this. He said, maybe we would include people like those who read their Bible and pray every day. Those are blessed people. Those who attend church regularly. They got a great attendance record. Those who give a whole lot of money. They're blessed. Those who know a lot about the Bible. Those who can preach really well. Those who evangelize often. Those who are pure and separate themselves from the world. Now, I want you to know that these are all things we should do, right? These are all things we should 
pursue, but I want us to think about this question. By what standard do we measure spirituality? By what standard do we measure true, authentic Christianity? In other words, what does it mean, really mean, to be a citizen of the kingdom of God? You see, it's imperative that we understand that, that this is a list of, in this list of blessings, Jesus does not give us a list of things to do to find favor, but rather paints a portrait of the type of person, the type of heart that belongs in the kingdom. These qualities reflect the heart of a kingdom citizen. And I would also suggest that it's better to understand this list of blessings not as a list of multiple people, but perhaps like a mosaic, a collection of pictures into one of what a kingdom person might look like. These are all describing a kingdom person. These blessings combined together paint for us a picture of the kind of heart that belongs in the kingdom of God. And we could spend a whole lot of time unpacking these, couldn't we? I mean, I feel like I could do a sermon on each one and still barely scratch the surface. So what I want us to do this morning is I want us to highlight three key themes that come out of this text. And these three themes will serve as the bedrock foundation core pillars of true authentic Christianity and discipleship. They are the standard for anyone who desires to live as a citizen, as a citizen in the kingdom. And the first is this. Kingdom people live in humility. Humility is all over the Bible, whether you like it or not, right? Humility is everywhere. You read, especially in the New Testament letters, Paul spends a whole lot of time talking about humility. Humility, not considering yourselves as more important than others. Why is humility so important? We see this come out in the first three of his Beatitudes. Out of all the places Jesus could start, where, where does he start? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Wow. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Of course, Jesus here is not referring to financial poverty, but spiritual poverty. What is spiritual poverty? This means that the one who knows about their spiritual need they know they're in sin, they know their wickedness, they know their hopelessness, they know their despair without Jesus, and it's for them that the kingdom of heaven belongs. If you think you got it all figured out, you're in the wrong place, right? If you think you got it all sorted, and I'm, I'm good enough, the kingdom of heaven's not for you, because the kingdom of God belongs to those who are spiritually poor, spiritually empty, spiritually bankrupt. We need a savior, Right? If we are king, he's not, but he's the king of kings. And so if we want to live in this kingdom, this is the type of disposition we must have. I want you to imagine how absolutely shocking this must have been for these pious Jews listening, right? And I think that's why Jesus starts here. He kind of just has an electrical shock on the crowd and is like, whoa, what is this, right? This, their entire religious system, specifically the Pharisees, many of their teachers, function on the assumption that God's reign can only be initiated by holy, pious living, right? If we are good enough, then he will return. If he, we're good enough, the temple will come back. His presence will come back. Jesus says that actually it's the one who knows they're spiritually bankrupt. They're the blessed one. How are we? Well, he's off to a good start, isn't he? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. These are those individuals who grieve experiences of tragedy, injustice, and death. And the fact is, all grief, all grief is rooted in sin. Either one's personal sin or the effects of sin. You see, death is not a natural phenomena. Therefore, we mourn. And it's for those who are in this state who are in grief and in pain and have those, those questions that just dig at you. Say, why, why, why? He's, it's those that God comforts. Paul calls him the God of all comfort in 2 Corinthians 1. It's not for those who have it all put together, but the one who suffers in humiliation and grief, God comforts, because that's who he is. You see, God is a God 
who is not apathetic about the human condition, but is aware of our pain, aware of our suffering, and as we're going to see, if you keep reading Matthew, embodies it himself on the cross. If you go back to the Old Testament, Hagar says, that's a God who sees me. Remember her? That's a God who sees me. Those who mourn, God comforts. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Many might associate meekness with weakness, but of course, that's not true. Someone who's a coward, of course, that's not true. We know Moses to be the meekest of all this day, according to Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Another good word for meek might be gentle. And Jesus himself calls himself gentle and lowly in heart. One who has patient faith. I like that. Patient faith. He says, for those who are meek, they shall inherit the earth. And this comes from Psalm chapter 37, verse 11. The psalm describes a meek or gentle person as one who, rather than seeking vengeance on one's enemies by their own hand, humbly and patiently trusts. They have a gentle spirit, humbly trusting in God's good provision and that he will make things right in the end. Yes, I've been cheated in this life. Yes, people have cut corners and cut around me. But ultimately, God's going to make all things right. God's going to make all things new. And after this judgment and after this cleansing, they'll inherit what's due to them, right? Because that's what God has given them. But I want you to see the point of these first three. That Jesus blesses those who live in humility he blesses those, the divine favor falls on those who find themselves in times of heartache, trouble, oppression, and justice, in, injustice, and choose to powerfully place their trust in God. That's where Jesus starts, of all places, is having a, a disposition of humility to say, I am here because I don't know where to go. I am here because I don't know what to do. I'm here because I make a terrible king, <laughs> Right? Jesus is king. God, our father, is the king of all kings, Lord of all lords. His name is above all names. So kingdom people, they're the ones who are humble. They're the ones who live in humility, who are poor in spirit. Kingdom people pursue righteousness. Pursue righteousness. We see this come out in the next three. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. If you pursue righteousness and that's your heart's desire, if you live in the kingdom, you're going to be stuffed because there's plenty of good things to do, right? Jesus says that those who seek righteousness, who hunger and thirst for it, you think about the deer that David writes about, like a deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. The one who hungers and thirsts and desires for righteousness, if you live in the kingdom, you're going to be full. You're going to be content. You're going to be satisfied. These are the people who desire to do the right thing. For those who desire to do what scripture says, to live holy lives that are pleasing to God, they will be satisfied in this kingdom because that's what this kingdom is all about. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. That's pretty straightforward, but hard to implement, right? Because we have a tendency to hold on to things. I have a, I have a tendency to hold on to grudges, to hold on to pains. I feel wronged. You know, if you only knew what I experienced when you did that to me, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. A kingdom person is one who is characterized by mercy. You see, this is very antithetical to what our world might expect. You get what is due to you, right? If you've been cheated, you cut corners too. Dog eat dog world, right? Climb the ladder. But if it is true that we serve a merciful God, why would we expect to live any differently? Because we serve a God who is a God of mercy. You remember that parable Jesus speaks about, about the different sizes of debts and the one who's been forgiven of this massive debt, but he turns around and he strangles the, the man that owes him a little? How can we hold on to other people's uh, and, and grab them by the throat when we have received so much mercy through the blood of Jesus, right? If you really believed what it cost for God to shower you with his mercy, this is how you lived, right? Blessed are the merciful, 
for they shall receive mercy. I remember studying with a lady who was on hard times in Texas years and years ago. She was really struggling with homelessness for years, in and out of, uh, you know, had drugs and um, struggled with drug addiction and things like that. And I remember studying with her while I was in AIM and uh, during my loving time before going to the mission field. And by, by God's providence, uh, another one of our classmates was also studying with her, but neither one of us knew. So let, all right, let's combine forces. Let's get together. So I remember we were studying, and we came to the point where she was ready to make a commitment. She said, yeah, I think I'm ready, Jeff. I, I want to be baptized. I want to commit my, my life to Christ. I'm like, why not tonight? You know, let's go. You know, I, I, I was ready. I was excited. She said, well, let's not do it tonight. So all the alarm bells go off and ding, 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 you know, red flags. I'm like, you know, that's, that's how I was trained. Urgency. Let's do it. See, there's water. What prevented thou from being baptized? Let's go. I said, well, you know, we, we can do it tonight. You know, we, we don't have to have a special ceremony. We can call some people down to the church. I'll get someone to unlock it. No, no, I don't want to do it tonight. Well, Rachel, if you could tell me, why, why don't you want to, why do you want to wait? Why do you want to wait till tomorrow? She said, Jeff, I've been hurt by a whole lot of people. I've been wronged by a whole lot of people. People that I love, people that I trusted. And According to what we've been studying, if I don't forgive them, God won't forgive me. So I'm going to need to spend a lot of time tonight forgiving people before I can follow him. And here I'm thinking, I don't know anything I'm talking about. This, this lady has got it. You know, She had taught me so much in this moment of blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Jesus later in the this, in this same sermon talks about forgiveness, right? How might we expect forgiveness from God if we don't forgive those near us? Kingdom people pursue righteousness, and part of right living, believe it or not, is extending mercy, because that is how God functions, because God is a God of mercy. And then blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Often when we think of the heart, we might think, of that little place within us that controls our emotions, that makes us flutter when we see uh, our spouse, see someone that we love, right? Um, We think of Valentine's Day, hearts everywhere. It's the symbol of love. But in the ancient world, the heart was not the center of emotion, but the center of one's will, the center of one's will. It was the very center of who you are and what makes you you and what you're all about. So Jesus says that those who are pure in heart, those whose entire priority is aligned with the will of God, that's the one who will see God. This is the person who seeks to live in accordance to God's will, who wants to do what God wants them to do. That's why David was called a man after God's own heart, not because he was perfect, because he was constantly realigning himself with the heart of God. And sometimes he had to be corrected. Sometimes he had to be rebuked. But he was a man at the center of it all who really ultimately wanted what God wanted. And that's why he was anointed as king. And we see the greater David, Jesus himself, say in the garden, Not my will, but what? Your will be done. So what we see in the second set of three (coughs) is a picture of one who is absolutely committed and dedicated to righteousness. The person who wants to do what God wills. To live how God would have them live. And this includes mercy. And this includes forgiveness to those who do not deserve it. For this is the type of God we serve. And thirdly, kingdom people create peace. Create peace. They live in humility. They pursue righteousness. And they create peace. Notice these last three. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Notice that Jesus does not say peacekeepers, right? He's not talking about people who are simply nice and quiet people who do not stir up trouble. He describes people who make and pursue peace, one who advocates and creates peace. Peace in Hebrew, the Hebrew word for peace in the Hebrew Bible is shalom, and it means this this wholeness, the the wholeness of how God intended something to function. And in the brokenness of of the world, 
God is pursuing shalom, the, the, the rightness, the right making of the world, the peace of the world. It's this type of person who seeks to create love and pursues reconciliation, create peace, excuse me, and pursues reconciliation between people. You know, the phrase uh, sons of, it says, for they shall be called sons of God. The word sons of was a common expression to signify one who took on a specific attribute or characteristic of another person. Therefore, if peacemakers are called sons of God, then that means God is a God of peace. And we see that title several other places. One of the most interesting places to me that I came across in my own studies is at the end of Romans. Uh, in, Romans chapter in Romans chapter 15, Paul calls God a God of peace. And then he calls him God of peace again in chapter 16, almost towards the end of his letter in verse 20. He says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Wait a second. That doesn't sound very peaceful, right? Crushing Satan under your feet. Well, he's going to make peace, right? He's going to create peace. He's going to generate peace. And so if we want to be sons of God, we're going to be ones who create peace. And that requires sometimes some very hard, awkward conversations, right? That requires courage. That requires faith. That be, requires being led by the Spirit, right? That requires all sorts of things if we want to be peacemakers. But if we want to be like God, that's what we must pursue. And then he doubles these last two together about those who are persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of uh, evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus doubles up on this theme of persecution here to emphasize that those who seek peace, who seek righteousness and justice, will often be persecuted. One author uh, wrote this, and I thought it was well said. His name is Scott McKnight. He said, blended together, the persecuted are those who seek God's will in spite of what others want, who love God so much they are faithful to God when oppressed and who follow Jesus so unreservedly that they suffer for him. Inherit in persecution, then, are both a love of God and a denial of self. That if we really want to love God, right, if we really want to be a part of this kingdom, if we really want to follow this king, it's going to come at a cost. And Jesus makes that cost very clear. He makes that cost very clear. If you want to follow me, pick up your cross. Right? The way of Jesus is the way of the cross. And what Jesus says at the very beginning is that when you are persecuted and when you suffer, you're actually blessed. God's divine favor is actually shown upon you. So this is the kind of person that Jesus says is blessed. A mosaic, a portrait of an individual who has the divine favor of God who belongs in the kingdom of God, one who lives in humility, one who pursues righteousness, and one who creates peace. How does one live in this way? Well, the beautiful thing about this is that the best commentary on the Beatitudes is the rest of the sermon. So you keep reading the Sermon on the Mount, and you'll see all of these three, these three themes woven together like a cord that just goes through the whole sermon. Humility, righteousness, and peace are three strands that are woven together through his entire sermon. But why does Jesus begin here? Why does Jesus spend time describing a kingdom citizen? Why describe the heart of a person that belongs in this kingdom? And the answer is that Jesus is forming a people. Jesus is forming a people for his mission. Now go back to this connection with Moses, right? If you remember Moses... Uh, God is using Moses to form the people of God for the mission of God. You will be to me a holy nation. You will be to me a kingdom of priests, right? You'll be my people who intercede between me and the world. Isaiah says, you'll be a light unto the nations. 
That is the entire vision of God, to seek and save the entire world through his formed and ever-transforming people. And that's why he ends with salt and light. That was read by Daniel a few moments ago. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? And it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You see, the Sermon on the Mount is all about the transformation of the heart, the transformation of God's kingdom people. But the purpose of this transformation is clearly laid out in these two images. Citizens of the kingdom are involved in the mission of the king. Let me say that again. Citizens of the kingdom are involved in the mission of the king. We are here to have an impact on the world. You see, salt by nature preserves and enhances. Salt is the enemy of decay. Light shines in the darkness. It illuminates everything it touches and brings it into reality. Neither salt nor light exists for themselves. What's the point of salt if there's nothing for it to impact? What's the point of light if there's nothing for it to impact? Neither exists for themselves, but exist to impact something else. In the same way, Christians exist in order to have a transformative impact on the world. I don't have to convince you that we live in a, cor in a corrupt world, do I? As salt of the earth, we are enemies of moral decay. As light of the world, we are enemies of ever-growing darkness. Not through yelling, not through political arguments, or through Facebook rants. It is through our transformed lives, through our transformed hearts and our example, that we show the world a better way to live, a countercultural way to live. So in a world of ever-increasing broken families, we show them a better way. In a world of dishonesty and cheating and cutting corners, we show them a better way. In a world of loneliness and despair, we show them a better way. In a world that's focused on the self and is filled with pride, we show them a better way. In a world full of lies and falsehoods, we show them a better way. In a world of division and brokenness and hostility, we show them a better way. Not as perfect people, but as saved people. Not as perfect people, but as growing people. People that are being transformed every single day. And that's why we are charged in Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, as we live our lives as a living sacrifice. Not be conformed to this world, but what? Be, that's a command, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. We're ever growing, being ever formed through the spirit of God to look like Jesus. And the warning that Jesus gives us is that we have the potential to lose our impact. We can lose our credibility. The sad truth of the matter is that Christians have the potential to lose their impact, to lose their saltiness, right? To hide their light. He says that those who have lost their saltiness are useless, according to verse 13, no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Those are some strong words, right? That's a really strong warning. And this is an important reminder for us this morning. Let me say it this way. Do not waste your relationships. Do not waste your relationships. God has uniquely placed each one of you, each one of us, right where we are. And the relationships you have, whether they're your family, whether they're your friends, whether they're in your workplace, God has placed you there. Do not waste those relationships because you have the potential, whether you believe it or not, you have the potential to have an eternal impact on the people that you love, on the people that God has put you in their lives. You have the potential to impact them like salt, to impact them like light. 
And remember, the ultimate goal is not to point people to us, but to point people to him, right? Verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and get glory to your Father who is in heaven. There should always be a 90-degree turn, right? If it's, wow, look how great of a person that is. Christianity is not, becoming, is not about becoming a slightly better person. Christianity is about being saved through the blood of Jesus and by the power of his spirit growing to look like him. Because we want to not, I don't want to show people Jeff. Jeff is dead. I want to show people Christ. Because Christ is alive and I'm in Christ. And because I'm in Christ, I'm alive. It's only because of him. And it's only in his power and in his image that I might have any chance of impacting a world and impacting my loved ones like salt and light. So return to Chicken Little with me for just a moment. In a world that is prone to panic, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the natural response might be to retreat, to blend in, to respond in fear or to hide in false securities. But Jesus' words remind us that our response as citizens of the kingdom must be different, right? The citizens of the kingdom, they live in humility, they pursue righteousness, they create peace, and they always seek to make an impact through a transformed life. Now, I imagine if I was in this crowd, I've been following Jesus, I've been seeing his great miracles, and he ascends to this mountaintop and he begins to speak this sermon. And he begins right about here, I would think, I have got no shot. <laughs> I mean, what an expectation. This is what the kingdom belongs to? How do we live into this? Ultimately, kingdom living is found through the cross of Jesus. So that's where we will end. Matthew chapter 16, 24 through 26. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loves his life for, or whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? If you want to be a citizen of the kingdom, you've got to follow the king. And the king goes to the cross. I love the way, this is where we'll end, I love the way Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he puts it like this. Here at the end of the Beatitudes, the question arises as to where in this world such a faith community actually finds a place. And what is his answer? At the cross. At the cross. The faith community of the blessed is the community of the crucified. With him, they lost everything. And with him, they found everything. You see, Jesus is the picture of this blessed person we see in the Beatitudes. Jesus is the picture. He is the portrait of the one that we see revealed in the Beatitudes. Jesus is the one who lives in humility. Jesus is the one who pursues righteousness. Jesus is the one who creates peace. And we are only able to live and be blessed in this kingdom through the cross of Christ. We're only able to pick up our cross because Jesus picked his up first. With him, we lost everything. And with him, we find everything. So this morning, let us find our hope and our trust and our ultimate security in Jesus and his kingdom. And that we, church, are a part of a kingdom that will never end. We are a part of a kingdom that will never die. And we serve a king who will reign eternal. Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall, but our king will sit on his throne forever. And if we want to live into this kingdom, if we want to be citizens of this kingdom, let us bow our knees to this king. And bow, this, bow our knees to a lamb who was slain. And so if you're here this morning and you're not a part of this kingdom, uh, let me encourage you to commit your life to Christ. If you'd like to be baptized this morning or if you just want to start a conversation and start a Bible study together, we would love to do that with you. But if you're here this morning and 
Maybe you feel a little bit like Chicken Little. Or maybe you've been feeling like Chicken Little, like what's going to happen? The world's all going downhill. Let me encourage you and let me challenge you. Let me challenge all of us to remember who ultimately sits on high. And that is Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, whose name is above all names. So let's put our hope and our faith and trust in him. And if we can pray for you in any way on your behalf, come now as we stand and sing our invitation song together.